Hello um, and welcome uh, to the Brooklyn Royals 188th New Social Environment. Um, I'm Anya Bernstein and I'm a production assistant here at the Rail. And I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between David Opdyke, Maya Wiley and Lawrence Wessler. We're also thrilled to have the poet, Allison Adele Hedgecoke here who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. The Brooklyn Rail recognizes the illegal annexation of Republic of Artsakh as a grave international injustice. We stand in support of the Armenian people and the global Armenian diaspora. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Skurlock, Jamil Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Dwayne Salau, Walter Wallace Jr. and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. So before I introduce our guests, I would like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now pass the mic to Eden from Mana Contemporary, who will give a little bit of background information uh, before we move into our conversation. Thank you, Anya. Um, I'm Eden, Director of Programming for Mana Contemporary. For those unfamiliar with Mana, it is a distributed institution anchored by cultural centers in Jersey City, Chicago, and Miami. Mana Contemporary is dedicated to celebrating the creative process supporting artists, and serving as a bridge between creative hubs worldwide. It offers world-class exhibitions, residencies, career development, and conversation in person and online. So stay tuned for exciting events and programs, both in person and online in 2021. Thank you, Eden. Um, and now uh, to introduce today's guests. David Opdyke is an artist known for his trenchant political send-ups of American culture. Uh, Opdyke's political awakening in the early 2000s led to a body of work that confronts the horrors of contemporary America. His hyper-real topographical models of suburbs comment on mall culture and suburban sprawl, while his sculptures of ruined monuments mock imperialistic hubris. His work is held in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, MoMA, and the Washington Convention Center. Maya Wiley is a nationally recognized racial justice and equity advocate. As counsel to the mayor, she delivered for New York City on civil and immigrant rights, women and minority owned business contracts, universal broadband access and more. After leaving City Hall, she held police accountable as chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board and worked to improve public education as a co-chair of the School Diversity Task Force. As a university professor at the New School, she founded the Digital Equity Laboratory. Maya is a veteran of both the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and the ACLU, was a former legal analyst for NBC News and MSNBC, and was the founder and president of the Center for Social Inclusion. Maya was also senior advisor on race and poverty at the Open Society Foundations. Maya Wiley is committed to a New York City where every New Yorker can afford to live with dig dignity, and that's why she's running for mayor. Lawrence Wessler is the author of over 20 books of narrative nonfiction, most recently in How Are You, Dr. Sachs. He's a former staff writer at The New Yorker, served as director of the New York Institute for the Humanities and artistic director of the Chicago Humanities Festival. His books include Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonder, Pulitzer Prize finalist, and Everything That Rises, a Book of Convergences, winner of a National Book Critics Circle Award. So without further ado, Ren, uh, take it away. Thank you and welcome everybody. Um, so, uh, am I on? Okay, I can't see, I see Anya, but I don't see myself, but okay, very good. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, I'm so glad to have both uh, Maya and David to talk to. I thought we'd spend uh, 20 minutes talking with David first and then uh, the next 20 minutes talking with Maya. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd begin this with, uh, here's the book, by the way, This Land, uh, which is a book about, uh, out from Monticelli Press, and it is basically about uh, David Updike's remarkable uh, postcard mural, 16 feet long, eight feet high. Um, anyway, and uh, it's mainly his imagery and, and, and some of my text. And I begin my text thinking about what role artists can have in thinking about climate change. And in many ways, all of my thinking on this is based on my conversations years and years ago, back in the 1980s with Jonathan Schell, uh, who began his great work, The Fate of the Earth, which was um, about, at that time, 1982, was really about the danger of nuclear arms. And uh, in many ways, in ways that he came to understand, it was really a precursor to all the discussion of climate change and so forth as an even bigger threat. But at that time, we're talking 82, 83, we're in the middle of the Reagan days. And there was a real sense that we were on the verge of nuclear war. He concluded Fate of the Earth by saying, two paths lie before us. I begin the book with this. One leads to death, the other to life. If we choose the first path, we in effect become the allies of death. And in everything we do, our attachments to life will weaken our vision, blind into the abyss that is open to our, at our feet, will dim and grow confused. Our will discouraged by the thought of trying to build on such a precarious foundation, anything that is meant to last will slacken and we will sink into, into stupefaction as though we were gradually weaning ourselves from life in preparation for the end. On the other hand, if we reject our doom and bend our efforts towards survival, then the anesthetic fog will lift our vision. Our vision no longer straining not to see the obvious will sharpen. Our will finding secure ground to build on will be restored and we will take full and close possession of life once again. One day, it's hard to believe that it will not be soon. We will have to make our choice. I think that's the thing that's really interesting about that passage is he talks about is a crisis of vision, of either being blind to what's going on or of opening our eyes. And in that sense, it's a real, it calls first and foremost, the essential workers in a really profound sense are artists. People who in the words of Eudora Welty, she says that uh, making the real real is art's job. And in that context, we come to David Updike. Uh, David, great to see you. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with just asking you, I mean, I've been following you for something like 15 or 20 years, I think, but maybe you can just give us a little background. We have some slides to show the kind of work, maybe give us a, two or three sentences about your background, but then show us, take us through some slides to show us some earlier work that led to this piece. Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Ren. Thank you, uh, Maya. Thank you, Rail, and of course, Man of Contemporary. Got to keep plugging it. Everybody should go and see the show if it's at all, at all possible. Uh, I don't know. I think I think what happened is I grew up in uh, suburban Schenectady, upstate, which was a sort of a post-industrial kind of uh, factory GE and uh, aluminum smelting town, and there was just a lot of uh, rotting downtown brownfields and blight, and then brand new uh, leafy suburbs that they just sort of bulldozed everything and made houses on hills and things like that. And so, you know, that kind of original sort of dichotomy in terms of, well, economic justice and in terms of uh, sort of an absurd, abusive attitude towards the environment, I think was just sort of there from the very beginning. It took me a long time to realize that I should be thinking about it and talking about it and envisioning it more clearly and more forcefully, but that was kind of always there from the beginning, sort of a critique of the suburbs. So that's where it all started, I guess. And, and then when I moved to New York, 
when you live in New York, everybody's problem is also your problem. We're all like jammed together and you have to start paying attention to uh, what's going on around you. You don't get to have the luxury of just being in your own little house on your own little hill. So I guess that's kind of what made me, again, pay more attention to uh, the urgency of uh, being involved in any way that I could. So. I remember at one point you talked about how things really began to change during the Florida catastrophe in, in, uh, in the 2000 election and the Gore versus Bush election and you became an NPR addict during that period <laughs> and your art began to change. Let's look at some of the, of the earlier pieces. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Here we go. Maybe you can talk about them. We'll just go through, let's we'll spend maybe a minute just going through to give some idea. Yep. The idea of thinking about this land is not new with you. This is all the way back, uh, an early piece. What is this? Yeah, this is 2003. Um, yeah, landscape was a, a large part of what I was thinking about. Uh, this is sort of the, this is the United States rendered as uh, a giant spaghetti tangle of oil pipelines and uh, storage tanks. It's about six and a half feet wide. That's on a tabletop. Go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. I thought there was a detail of that, but that's okay. So then this is sort of uh, a follow-up piece a couple years later, same size, thinking more about the election of, uh, uh, of 2004 and how it was splitting the country apart, literally, figuratively, and then also just sort of dividing things and sort of making a disaster out of all of uh, everything we think about. Uh, next slide. Um, then I started dealing a little bit more with sort of the fusion of the built environment and how it would look after maybe 20 or 30,000 years. The idea that some incredibly tall skyscrapers would start to look a little bit more like uh, seaside cliffs and sort of uh, just sort of thinking ahead to sort of the decline of uh, all our greatest and tallest towers and things like that. This object itself is probably about seven feet tall. It's all made of styrofoam and stuff like that. So next slide. Oh, and then this, this sort of follows in that same idea. I mean, at the top, you've got like some trees sort of cut away through the earth, the strata of like maybe the Jurassic and the Triassic, but actually at the very, very bottom, there's a seam, if you go to the next slide, which is basically us sort of, uh, you know, what's, what's gonna be left behind all the broken uh, industrial scraps and plastics and things, you know, sort of turned into a, a seam of coal to be discovered uh, in 100,000 years maybe or something like that, or maybe 100 million years. Uh, next slide. So yeah, um, maybe about five years ago, looking around for some new inspiration, new uh, images and source material, I just started working with, uh, Postcards from the early 20th century, sort of uh, older kind of uh, lithographic presentation. And also, I mean, it, it pretends to sort of show a more innocent time before we started messing things up. I guess when we were all proud of bridges and highways and bank buildings. And then- uh, Now these postcards, would... by the way, these were, the, these were in the 1910s and 1920s. It was a lithography yeah. where it was black and white photography and then they were hand uh, colored, and then they were mass yeah. right. And exactly. Every town had them, and they all had, uh, uh, you know, the, the highlights of the town, the town square, the, the library, the dam, uh, the bridges, and, and so forth. And, and lot, Lots of highways, very exciting highways. So next slide. Go on eBay, you can find a lot of them, right? Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Um, and uh, so this is the House of Representatives, the Supreme Court and the Senate chamber, um, sort of like going back to the oil empire piece with all the oil pipelines and showing how it literally penetrates into the uh, inner workings of the government. Next slide. Uh, again, here's uh, the Capitol building, either engulfed in snow or drowning in, in water. I'm not really sure which, it, it could be either way. And so just to be clear, these are actual postcards that I find and I like carefully paint on them. They're, there's no Photoshop, there's no scanning. These are one, one singular objects. They're not reproducible. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and sort of more strange mashup of industrial extraction and uh, the actual rock 
This piece of yeah. that photograph is actually called the Oil District in Wyoming. Huh? Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes the title uh, that's printed on the postcard is it's, is a nice, helpful sort of cue inside to what I'm going to do with the do with the imagery. Also, the famous it's the famous teapot dome. Look at that. Yes. <laughs> okay, keep going. Next slide. All oh, right. Yes, California. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Uh, yeah, next slide. <laughs> More California. So you were doing these one-offs, basically. Yeah. And uh, for a couple of years. A couple of years, and then what happened? Keep going. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it just sort of occurred to me that I started combining them in twos, like in threes, like that uh, Senate um, House of Representatives and uh, Supreme Court one, and then I maybe did a cluster of nine, which is about the. Um, uh, Library of Congress on fire and assembling like a sort of a comic book and having things uh, drift from pain to pain like columns of smoke and fire. Uh, and then I, I just sort of felt like I needed to leap onto something bigger. And I sort of proposed this absurd giant grid of postcards that would sort of form a large landscape for a, uh, for a grant that I didn't give, get. And oh yeah, here we go. And uh, I didn't get the grant, and a couple months later, I just decided I'd better just dive into it. So, so this is, just see the, see the, uh, and that's there it. There you go. It's uh, so statistically, it's 16 feet long. It's eight feet high. Yeah. It is currently up at Mana Contemporary in Jersey City, which you can get to by path very easily, and you can uh, to the Journal Square in Jersey City, and it's. It's like five miles from uh, uh, from the Holland Tunnel exit, so it's quite reachable. You have to make reservations these days, and they are fanatic on safety, so you don't have to worry about that. But anyway, uh, uh, you put together a four a four minute uh, film. We were kind of running. Let's go directly to it of uh, looking through the uh, this piece that you, uh, film that you made. So let's look at that. Yeah, it's sort of like a virtual tour. It sort of like you know, drives you through it. We'll see. Hopefully, it won't. Uh... If it starts to glitch out, Nick, I can do it manually sort of from my website. Let's just sort of see how this all goes, right? So just describe as, we, as we're going through it. You can talk over. Well, we're sort of going into sort of a desert, just desertification area to the left as things are sort of falling apart. I mean, basically what I'm doing is in each postcard, I'm making things happen like homeless encampments, uh, signage bemoaning the, uh, uh, the destruction of the climate, like finding oil pipelines in the, in the ice like that one. Uh, there's fire and flood. Um, yeah, and there's lots of graffiti sort of commenting on how things are going badly. This is all going, these are pieces from the early 20th century and now looking toward the mid 21st century, basically. Yeah, I mean, one thing I realized is this whole uh, supposedly more innocent time that these postcards depict was not so innocent. We were on the road to um, destroying the climate and sort of over extracting resources and you know, late stage capitalism when we, from the get go. So here we are with like seawalls and a stadium filled with water, maybe to sort of divert the flooding to some other unlucky neighborhood strange sea creatures poking out of the ice underneath the Rockefeller Center. Um, another sort of megafauna puss, as you call it, sort of reaching over a dam because it's been, I don't know, maybe like the, can't deal with the, the overheating water. I mean, a lot of this stuff is sort of direct and indirect. I mean, uh, I don't know where these butterflies are going, but they're clearly fleeing something and they're a little bit confused about where they should be. Uh, vines overgrowing uh, habitations and sort of taking over. Um, and then there's a, what you can see is the bottom of two large tornadoes, sort of a, you have a raft of migrants being thrown into the air, paddles and signage and um, advertising being thrown everywhere. And then of course there are fires everywhere, particularly in the West. There's one of my favorite cards. This guy seems to be explaining to his wife what the fire is.
yeah, and uh, just generally speaking, there's a lot of environmental destruction, man-made uh, foolishness. And then uh, I guess I glossed over this a little bit too quickly earlier, but as we were driving over the, uh, the cities to the sort of south of where we are right now, there's a lot of commentary. Um, uh, billboards saying EPA lies or um, advertisements for an arc, which is being built, you'll see a little bit later and uh, other biplanes with uh, banners saying the ARC is fake or get your ticket. Or this sort of like- favorite, One of my favorites is uh, action, legislative action would be premature. Yes, so, exactly. Biplane. <laughs> so after setting things on fire and causing floods and tornadoes and having a battle of locusts and uh, monarchs as you're just seeing right here, I thought one of the more important things to think about was how people react and how they respond or don't. I mean, there's the arc right there. Because in the end, it's, it's, we're the ones who are at risk. The earth will go on as George Carlin said, Alcatraz, to shake us off. Alcatraz, yeah, Alcatraz. And, uh, luxury living for millionaires, prisons for millionaires. Right. But I mean, the way we react and the way we respond will determine whether we can fix things. And, you know, for a very long time, there's been a lot of controversy, fake, and real and a lot of uh, digging in of heels and confusion and sort of misinformation about what's actually happening. So here we have a plague of frogs being thrown around. There's some biblical references in here at the end of the world and the apocalypse and stuff like that. Yeah, th there's, there's a lot in here. <laughs> and then we're just sort of slowly backing out into sort of the overall view of the entire thing. I, I must say, David, that uh, the people who have been going to see it live, where, wherever it's been, and by the way, it's been uh, in, uh, in various places. It's been in Michigan and North Dakota and so forth. And I hope we'll continue traveling the country. But, but uh, people spend 20, 30 minutes because there's a lot. We just went through that very fast, but you just get stuck and it's, it's quite interesting. One of the, can we look back at the slide of the piece as, as a whole? And by the way, I should say that if you get the book, it comes apart, the, the, and you have a little poster of the whole thing, so you can really study it, <laughs> the, 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 the bet jacket. But uh, the, 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 as you first see it, yeah, as you first enter the room, it has this kind of look of a uh, grid of some sort, you don't quite make out what it is, but it, it has this kind of alpine, sublime uh, uh, mega or, or, or landscape. And it struck me two things about that, that uh, go to the next slide. That in a way, and I'll go back to that first slide, the slide just before it. It's like a map, uh, you know, back, back to the, yeah, right, stay there. But that, it, you call it this land, but in some ways it's another example of America itself breaking up. So if I were to say to you, look at what's going on over in Oregon or, or look at the Great Lakes over there, or look at Texas. Texas is where the debate is happening, or Florida seems to be falling off the map and so forth. But then go one further, go, go to the map uh, of the United States, now go to the next one. It's also striking to me how this, that the wider image is part of a long American tradition of the, of the sublime. This land was this great, great, you know, open field for imagination. Interestingly in here, the Yosemite, this is Thomas Moran's uh, Yosemite and the Grand Canyon of the Yosemite. Uh, the waterfall is exactly at the same place if we go back up to, to, to the original image of the thing, where the, yeah, where the sunrise is between the two mountains. Um, there's all kinds of things like that. Did you have the American sublime in mind when you were doing these? I don't think I ever have much of that kind of stuff consciously, but um, one of my favorite parts of the Metropolitan Museum is that whole uh, Hudson River School yeah. zone that they had in the back right corner for a very, very long time. And I, I love that kind of work. It, it just doesn't operate or come through on a conscious level. So yeah, sure. I mean, I was definitely thinking about uh, mm -hmm. uh, frontier aesthetics and sort of wide open spaces and then constricted cities and stuff like that, for sure. Um I want to move on to my in a second. We'll come back and talk more after my leaves, maybe at two o'clock. But 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 one thing I did want to bring out was this amazing thing where, uh, and then one other thing I want to look at uh, before we go to Maya. But but you thought all this stuff was going to be twenty or thirty years from now, 
and during the, during the two years since you made it, it's all happening. California yeah. fire and so forth. I mean, it's it's, it's really it, it, that in itself is quite upsetting. I also just wanted to bring out let's let's go forward on the slides. That this is something that a lot of artists have been confronting, uh, and there were just a few examples I wanted to show before I introduce Maya. Uh, let's go forward slide, forward slide, forward slide. So that, for example, Chris Burden, this amazing Medusa's head, which kind of has the same shock. It's like this asteroid just in which the, tr the tracks, in this case, not so much the, uh, the pipes are, are strangling this thing, or you go forward another one. Uh, this was an amazing piece. I have a whole section in the book of other artists and what other artists have done. This was a remarkable piece that was done at the uh, Louisiana Museum, which was a hour long performance piece in which ordinary people in a, there were thousands of people and then suddenly ordinary people were just kind of mesmerized and began walking. After about 45 minutes, you may realize they were gonna walk directly into the water and just keep walking. And it, it's as if they were sleepwalking and it was a way of, the Billenstof Theater in Denmark, and they and it you know, sleepwalking as a way of waking us up. Keep going up to how we're sleepwalking. Keep going. The famous piece that was at the Lithuanian Lithuania's Pavilion, uh, which was uh, at at the Venice Biennale, where where you could look down on this beach basically, and it turned into an opera. They were singing strangely about how weird the weather's been lately, and so forth. Remarkable piece. And one more. Let's go. Let's go. This is the famous crocheted coral reef. Tens of thousands of people around the world are trying to save the coral reefs by crocheting coral reefs to bring attention to it. Anyway, I, 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 we can talk more. We are talking to artists in this segment, but, uh, but let's go to Maya for a second or for the next 20 minutes. Uh, Maya, are you there? Uh, I'm here. Okay, there you are. <laughs> Maya, I wanted to start with you. Uh, people who know you and, and from MSNBC and from your merit campaign and so forth know that your father uh, was one of the leading poverty and civil rights campaigners, but don't necessarily know, know as much about your mother. And she was, in fact, an art dealer, wasn't she? In addition to all, in addition to all the rest. Well, yeah, and I think, I mean, I just want to say to David, um, just how stunning your work is. And I mean that both visually in terms of its beauty uh, and in terms of its impact, in terms of what you're trying to. So as stunning in all the most important ways. And I think that the relationship to what David, uh, you described as your process of getting to the point where your expression in art uh, was also about your consciousness about the environment is also kind of my mother's journey from being an activist who loved art <laughs> into becoming an art dealer. <laughs> uh, it, it, so, but because for her, it wasn't about the dealing, you know, it was about the art. <laughs> and in Washington, DC, right? Yes, it was in Washington, DC, the Franz Bader Gallery. Uh, but the way she started, um, she, you know, she, was, she always loved art. Um, she thought about being, uh, you know, she loved to draw herself. Um, she used to joke that she, in college, recognized she had two different career pathways. One was to art and the other might be to law because she was a debater. And so she had a kid, who, me, who went to law school and another kid, my brother, who became an artist. <laughs> so, you know, you live things out sometimes through your children. But, but for her, art, in addition to loving art, for art's sake, is that it was always an expression uh, for activism uh, and for the principles and values about what kind of society we should be. And for her art gallery, she committed her art gallery to DC-based artists uh, as her own expression <laughs> of what was important about supporting people and community as someone who also sold art. And I, I was going to ask for let's, I was going to ask for a little bit about your own experience of art early on, but let's go directly from that more to the the fact that you're now running for mayor, and this is in a city that is in a tremendous economic crisis, the plight of all sorts of people. But surely, 
partly because of your background, but just because you're a New Yorker, you at this point, you would agree that the arts are absolutely central to the soul of the city and artists are in particularly tough, having particularly tough time. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that in terms of how thing, how wh what can be done uh, in the city, maybe in the whole country, but especially in the city, if you're the mayor, what can be done to, to help address the crisis of the art world? Yeah. Uh, so first, let's acknowledge that, you know, what we have to do is not just recover from COVID, but recover what we love about the city. It's not just <laughs> enough to say we've gotten past this pandemic, which we must uh, for all kinds of reasons, but that we're, we're trying to recover what we love about New York City and that arts and in, at that arts culture, everything from theater and plays and music and all the visual arts are a core part of what is so valuable about New York City. It's also a core part of what has been inequitable about New York City. So it's it's both bringing art back, but recognizing it's who we're holding on to. A friend of mine uh, founded uh, helped found a project called the Laundromat Project, right? Which is taking back laundromats and the idea of community spaces, particularly in low-income communities of color, as spaces that can become spaces for the creation of art. Uh, and that we have artists in all our communities. And that part of what we're supporting is both our big cultural institutions, which we need to save and bring back, but it's also like the Brooklyn Museum where some of David's work is, it's dear to me, uh, but it's also the, the, the small neighborhood-based indigenous artists and art projects, which become such an important part of our cultural expression and our recognition of who we are and why our diversity matters and how that also elevates our social consciousness, our collective consciousness, because people bring their experiences uh, and, in, in, in our city and in their lives to their expressions of art. And then that also starts elevating problems that we have to solve. So as a city, it's everything from arts education, which took a huge hit in the last budget and something that is like deeply important also just to the quality of education for our kids because they need that expression in order to be engaged in their educational lives. Uh, we know that music, it, music is an important ingredient to learning math. So that these are, you know, these aren't, we keep calling them things like, you know, what do we, enrichment. It's not enrichment, it's core. <laughs> And we have to start treating it as core. Uh, and I think it, it, it also improves us in all the ways that you know, David, David's work is also showing how art is actually integral to uh, both creating community and solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote the afterword to the book and uh, it came right after the coda that I wrote where I talked about how uh, we sometimes find ourselves sandwiched between deny, people who are denying that there's a climate change crisis at all, which is obviously horrible in terms of being able to act on it. But then even the other side, which is despair, you know, like there's nothing that can be done anymore. There's, you know, it's just and, and that somehow you had to find some way in between those two uh, determination maybe. And it's a narrow path, but you just have to do it. And it's really, really important. Uh, you began your essay by talking about uh, a, a fourth D, which was double consciousness. And you use the example of your daughters who you say are quite woke, uh, and yet, tell the story about driving them. Yeah, uh, no, so, so my daughters who are like their generation quite woke and care about the climate and, you know, and then will ask me to drive them six blocks because they don't want to walk. And then I point out, I said, you know, and that whole climate conversation we've been having. And I was like, you know, we just add to the carbon footprint if I drive you instead of you walking <laughs> the six blocks. And then one daughter, they both laugh at the contradiction. They recognize the contradiction, right? And one da daughter goes to, uh, you know, the first path. <laughs> that, that no, she, the gloom and doom, we're all gonna die anyway. So you, might as well drive, you might as well drive me six blocks, it won't yeah, matter. Yeah, so you might as well drive me six blocks because we're all gonna die. Uh, uh, versus the other daughter who says, 
no problem, let's buy a Tesla. Uh, so, yeah. right? And well, they're joking, they're joking, right? They're joking, it's their, it's their uh, funny, you know, smart girl clap back at their mama, but they still want me to drive them, <laughs> All right? And that's the, that is, that is the dual consciousness problem. It's like, I get and want, and I'm conscious that I want to address. And it's not just a problem for, it's a problem for the society, is for so many of us that we embrace and want this change. And then we're asked to change something in our very practical daily lives in ways that feel painful to us. And we're like, no, I'm just gonna jump in the car. Uh, and you know, I'm, we're all guilty of it to some degree, right? You know, because it, it, it and, and this is the acknowledgement, it's not about attacking my kids, it's about, because <laughs> I do it too sometimes every once in a while, and I'm like, oh, I should take the subway. And I should, I should take, and, 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 and this is the other thing. It's like, if, what do we do that recognizes the dual consciousness? And I think the idea of emotional, the emotional connection that art co connects us to, is critically important in addressing that dual consciousness, right? We need the emotional connection, not just the intellectual connection. Because the intellectual connection, we can always start debating with ourselves and making a different decision. Um, and, and then to be stunned in an, in an emotional way, uh, in the way that David's work stuns us, right? It reconnects us to what's real. Makes um, the real real. This is the real, real, and and but in an emotional way, and in a way that is not just about verbalizing statistics or being conscious uh, of climate change, but actually saying, no, 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 this is the this is the real, real. Uh, this is this is the this is the emotional connection to the reality, uh, and we all need that uh, to to navigate the dual consciousness. It occurs to me, looking up ahead, in a kind of WPA sort of way that one of the things that needs to be helped are actual government support of artists, uh, that in the past of the WPA, most of the WPA was about commemorating the past. Most of the way we think about political art as a public project, public art pieces, is, uh, you know, sculptures of great heroes of different, you know, uh, groups and so forth and so forth. But maybe we need to really be focusing on having artists all around the city help us to see what's coming. Mm -hmm. that, that, that the subject for a WAPA program is really to support things that make the need for climate change real in a way that, I mean, the need for confronting it in a way that, that makes it part of the discourse of the city. And so something to think ahead. One thing I want to ask you, by the way, is uh, a great part of the, of the essay is you talking about the difference between the vantage of the political activist, which you spent most of your life being, and the person who, is, who is a, was in the government itself for a while and aspires to be in the government, and how uh, they, they have different, uh, there's a dialectic between them and they both have to be understanding of each other. I think that might be some, valuable for people yeah, to hear. Yeah. There, 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 there is a natural tension between activism and governance. Uh, and that tension in part, and I say tension not as a bad word, we need the tension. <laughs> the tension can be extremely constructive and we need movement. I reference the Sunrise Movement in the piece because we need the folks that demand and aspire to something big, bold, and transformational. Uh, because if we are short-sighted about our aspiration, we will also be short-sighted in our action, right, from the governance side. But it's also what David's, I mean, you know, I love these postcards and it's their, they're the ones connected uh, to my afterword, which is the which is the impact and the power of the private sector of the fossil fuel economy in the governance. So we need the activism, we need the push, the big hard push from outside to counter the influence that money has in politics. And, and just to give one statistic about just how powerful it is, there's one study from 2013 that showed that for every dollar the fossil fuel industry spent in either camp financing campaigns or lobbying, yielded $119 in subsidy, in subsidy for fossil fuels. So when I see David's postcard, that when I see these, I'm like $119 in subsidy for every dollar spent. <laughs> okay. 
oh, like right. straight to this. But but on the governance side, then the challenge because of that reality is you need that push on the asset. But but part of part of governance is to say it's it's almost impossible to leapfrog to the aspiration, right? We in in one bound. And, and the trick of governance is to push as far in a structural way, in a way that is a fundamental shift, that is hard to undo, that creates the next level of opportunity for the activists to push it another step. And that's the complicated dialectic because then the activists are like, that's not far enough. And you're like, no, it's not. No, it's not. And so we have to figure out how you utilize this to push farther rather than undermining and attacking the achievement, because if you undermine and attack the achievement, it's, it, it serves those who are trying to push it back. And so that's the dialectical tension. Uh, and I think, of, and a big part of that is, and why someone like me is running is, we, 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 we need, it, some of it is about the trust that we're getting the decision-making that is like, this is actually, this is, this, this is the leap right now. Uh, and that means a trusted partnership of folks who hold and share the aspiration uh, and are pushing and that you know are pushing as hard as possible and saying, this is, this is it. If we give this up, right? If we give this up, we may lose and be set back another 20 years that we can't afford to lose. Uh, so that's the dialectic. And I think that's also part of a demand that our governance both live that aspiration, embrace it, uh, and be more transparent and partnering with the activism so that it can be strategic, so that it can walk, not together because they have different roles, but in alignment that starts to get real achievement uh, because we have to make bigger and, 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 and better progress uh, and push back on what is a very powerful force in our politics, which is money and money that is not. Having said that, just to uh, push you a little further, eventually we'll get there. We don't have eventually on this particular issue. In other words, in, in, the, in the piece you, uh, you talked about uh, Obamacare, for example, as, as far as it might be arguably as far as you can get at that point, but it set up the basis for the next thing. But with some of the stuff with climate change, you know, we're, and, and the point that we, I had with David that you know, he thought it was 30 years up ahead, it's happened in the last two years. Yeah. We don't have the well, time. So what, well, no, well, I think this is the, you know, this is, you know, one of the things that we have to change in New York City government is that resilience is, is a separate category of work from climate change. Because the reality is to David's, to, to David's point, which is I think absolutely right and powerful, we have to walk and chew that gum <laughs> at the same time because some of it is about our resilience. And some of it is about how we're investing in that resilience and whether we're benefiting in a, and, and whether that resilience is also building some of that strategy on climate change, right? Because some of those resiliency, let me give you a concrete example. So, you know, one of the great things about the Green New Deal was that it was big and aspirational and it touched all the notes, right? That we need to touch when we talk about climate change, which is that we have to recognize that we have to make big progress much faster, uh, but it also that we will make more progress when we, when we create better jobs that folks who need them can get and then be able to be better and more empowered to be resilient in the face of climate change. Like that those two things are both true. And the attack on the Green New Deal, the attack on the Green New Deal is, we don't know what you're talking about and it's just big and fluffy and just costs a lot of money. And, and the opportunity of that is to lean heavily into exactly what you said, Ren, which is, you know, but right, but we're going to spend money on infrastructure. I promise you we will have an infrastructure bill, but what infrastructure and who benefits from the infrastructure? Does, does the environment benefit from the infrastructure and do the people most at risk because of the ravages of this climate change? which in New York City, two thirds of the folks in flood zones are people of color, low income, and put there because of systemic racism. Uh, and now we're most vulnerable to climate change. So do they get the benefits of the jobs and, and does the resiliency benefit them? And does it help, does it help actually solve those problems? That's a practical step that deals with both the resiliency 
and, and the climate change at the same time where we can be bigger and bolder, uh, but we have to recognize that it's a both and because we're not gonna completely solve the problem of climate change in a leap, even though we should. It's like the Paris Accord, right? Was that adequate? Was it enough? No. Was it better than, what, than not participating in it? Absolutely, right? And so it's holding both those things and then making use of it to drive why it's not adequate enough while we're embracing that we're doing it to do the next big thing. Maya, uh, we only have you for another 12, 13 minutes. So I wanna open it to questions. Uh, Anya, are you ready? How do you wanna, how do, you wanna do this, Anya? Um, I think people are still like, questions are still brewing in the chat. So if you wanna, if, you know, Ren, if you have any questions for Maya. Okay, well, let me, let me uh, try one and then people have our, and then yeah. Anya will be the yeah, traffic cop of the questions. Uh, let me ask one question to you on uh, Maya. Uh, you just uh, went to the Green New Deal. Why are you running for mayor rather than for Congress or for Senator? Uh, since that's where the Green New Deal is gonna happen or let me flip it around and say- Who's best? What, what, no, what, <laughs> uh, so let me flip it around. I don't what, have to accept what, the premise of that. <laughs> okay, but, but let me ask, what can a mayor do in a city? If you win, you're gonna come to a city that's bankrupt. And, no, it's not. Stop that. It ain't bankrupt. Okay. Talk, talk Stop. No, no, no. This is, this is, this is, here's what we can't do. We can't ignore one that we have power at local level, even though, yes, we need the other levels of government, but we have power of local level to do some things in a transformative way. I just said, we are going to have an infrastructure bill. It's shocking that we didn't get one under Trump because it's the one thing that Democrats and Republicans agree on. But we are now going to get an infrastructure bill. But when we get an infrastructure bill, who do you think tries to navigate and get some of those funds and what those funds do? City government. Not only, it also state, but it give, if we don't have folks contesting at local level for what the infrastructure dollars should do and who will be utilizing it for green infrastructure that gets green jobs, to folks who are unemployed in New York City, we are not gonna solve climate change because this is the one thing we know. Anytime we look at, you're right, we need all levels of government uh, and we need folks in Congress, uh, both Senate and, and the House pushing for Green New Deal, but it's, it's, it's state and local governments that are gonna give meaning to what the work is under the Green New Deal and who actually have the ability to say, we're gonna show you an infrastructure project that is going to be aiding us on bringing down our carbon emissions at the same time that we're creating more possibility for people who have been excluded from the economy to participate in greening it. And that matters because what we always know is that when we allow poverty and racism, we're actually allowing we're allowing the forces that are creating the climate that's killing us. Back to that okay. one, if that, who, who, one of the people, somebody said that the one good thing about climate change is that, uh, that the only possible way for us to get through it is for things to become much better than they are right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and just to make this point, when, and polling shows this, it is people of color who are constantly and at high percentage deeply concerned about the environment. But if you're struggling to eat, if you can't get the energy efficient refrigerator, <laughs> if you can't, if you don't have, if you can barely hold on to your home and you can't do the things that will bring your carbon footprint down, you don't, even given your concern, you cannot participate despite the fact that you want to. And unless we are enabling every single one of our people to participate and be part of the solution, we're not gonna have one. And that's what city government can do. Anya, any questions for us? Yeah, yeah, we have a question from Andre, which I think is a great follow up to uh, what we were just touching on. So Andre, you can unmute yourself or you're, you're unmuted now. Uh, yes. Just talk, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Andre? Oh, I see. Okay. I this think, is a there you are. <laughs> hi. This is a question for Maya, who is my mayor, as far as I'm concerned. Um, artists are essential workers in New York, and uh, uh, the local WPA program wouldn't that be a very good idea? It would be an excellent idea. <laughs> excellent. Um, and let me just say uh, one thing we can do right now, which we weren't, is to does it go directly to environment except to our cultural environment? But we need artist housing. You know, when we talk about who can who who needs affordable housing, it is it is our artists, uh, from visual artists to musicians to to actors who actually are getting pushed out of the city even before COVID. So that's one thing. And there's an opportunity for us in this crisis to take resources and look at vacancy, both in the form of what creates artist housing, <laughs> the housing for folks who are doing exactly things that David is doing. Um, but also to your point about a, a WPA-like program, you know, we have to push hard when we're talking about federal relief. And this is one of the things that cities can do. Cities can band together and ask for direct subsidy, uh, not just have it go through state houses. We used to do this before Ronald Reagan, by the way, that cities would get aid from the federal government that it could then utilize the ways that it saw fit. And that means more pro pro proactivity around creativity, right? Because you can then use those dollars in ways that does exactly that. Uh, so one of the things that I would do is work with other cities to say, let's get, let's get more money that gives us more flexibility locally about how we spend it. Uh, so that we can do these really creative economy things. Uh, that is something that is essential. And it's essential for all the reasons we've said, it's because the people themselves are essential to our communities <laughs> and, to our, and to our economy uh, and also to our recovery and to our reimagining. Thank you. Thank you. Anya, anybody else? I think JC um, has a question. JC, can you, uh, let me unmute you. There you are. Hi, thank you everyone for this conversation. I'm excited to hear more from um, David next about a lot of those images were like really, the, the one of the burning palm trees, I don't know, there was like, San Diego was in a huge drought, they finally got rain and then like a palm tree got struck by lightning, it was burning, it was like, an apocalyptic uh, just image. But my question right now is, is for Maya. And um, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want, I don't want this to sound like I'm picking on you, but I, um, you can pick on me. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, when I hear, look, the Department of Defense is like the largest polluter, like um, consumer of fossil fuels in the world by like a lot, like a huge margin. And when I hear people framing the conversation of climate change around personal actions that we can take, I'm sort of like, yes, but how do we, I mean, the Vietnam, the anti-Vietnam War movement, like two decades, and they still couldn't like unseat the, the, I mean, the economic engine of this country, if we're being realistic. So, and one of my issues with the art world, I guess, is that it sort of on the whole insulates itself from culture at large probably not by choice, but that's a little bit how it is. Like going to galleries is not something that you do if you live anywhere other than New York City or Los Angeles, really. Um, or DC. <laughs> or DC. Or <laughs> I did it in DC. <laughs> not, not to, not to, not yeah. to be reductive, but it's, um, it's not super, it's not really, art's not really a common part of like daily life for many Americans. And there's a really, there's a big jump that needs to happen between looking at art and being moved by it and the like high level policy that can actually make a dent in the issues that our country is facing. And, and I guess my question is how can, if at all local policy kind of like help foster an environment where people are able to make that, that jump? It, look, I think you're raising really important points and, and I completely agree with you that, you know, there are these big structural problems and you're not, and it's not just, I, I, I'm, I don't mean to suggest it's just about personal responsibility. Believe me, that's not how I think about it. I do think about it as deep engagement uh, because the, 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 the role, so put aside 
art galleries and museums. Because, you know, part of what's happening is we only talk about art as if that's the place it happens. And the reason I was talking about schools, the reason I was talking about education, actually a big part of where our arts budget got cut uh, were for programs, including after school programs that are engaging students, not just in the practice of art, and in some instances, not for profits that are engaged as art as part of um, organizing. You know, we forget that art, I mean, my brother comes out of a, and his partner who's a musician and a video artist come out of a tradition of activism, of art as part of activism. So I think we shouldn't um, cubbyhole art <laughs> as if it's only this thing we hang on walls, <laughs> right? <laughs> or that, because it's, mu it's much more than that. And so whether we have a mural project, you know, groundswell where, where, where the art itself is a process of engaging in community and thinking about how it addresses community issues uh, in a, and, and often in a structural way. Um, and so it's, not, it's, a, it's a both ands, because you're right. So it's not to, it's not, that's not a disagreement. You're right about the defense budget. It's not just about fossil, it's about fossil fuels. It's also about the percentage of our federal budget that is defense. Uh, and unnecessarily so, and how that deprives us of investment uh, in, in place and in community and in people. My point about the power of the local is that so often the ideas that become the ideas that move in federal government get developed, incubated, and proven at local level. And we can't forget that as part of our strategy. We, we can't forget that when, when local or state government shows that we can have a different impact on climate by doing something differently, cities, let me tell you what happens, because I did, we did this in City Hall around broadband. We were sharing what we were learning, we were experimenting, and then we were collectively going to federal government and saying, this is what we need from you. We can show you how it works. And it starts to get, and when you, and it starts to change then what your congressional delegation is demanding. It starts to change, you know, what, what then the White House, when you've got a White House, you know, that was going to listen, will be willing to do. And so it absolutely matters. And then it helps, it helps infuse and drive the strategy that says, well, then we also have to rethink that federal budget and what we're doing with that federal budget, including why is such a big percentage of it going to defense when we could be solving these problems at home. So I do think the local has to be a, a, a critical part of how we see that strategy of solutions, innovation that solve these problems um, and that tell the federal government what the federal government has to do differently to solve them. Maya, do you have time for one more question? I do. Okay, Tanya, give her another question. <laughs> um, great, we have a question from Jeremy. Hey there. Um, I um, this builds a bit on uh, some of the stuff that JC uh, just asked a little bit, but just um, and I've spent plenty of time in government uh, building digital infrastructure. So like, uh, so this is where it it some one of the one of the things that I definitely learned uh, in my time in government is that we're in a crisis of imagination, which all of you have uh, talked about, like everything is so tangible and real. And I mean, just like so right in front of you and not enough time spending imagining like what the future could be. Um, and so like, and one of the biggest challenges for people in government is uh, just in doing innovation is, is um, concrete, making those ideas concrete and actionable and, and fitting them in. And so people have ideas and they're great ideas and stuff, but those ideas don't get acted upon. And a lot of times it's not because it's a bad idea or because somebody's stopping them. It's just because they don't have what they need to draw the connection between the idea and then making it real. So given that you're talking to a bunch of artists, right? Like, um, and a bunch of people who uh, do do things like what advice do you have for taking that idea and making it tangible like what are what are some best practices for that oh that's such a great question um uh, and let me just say some of it is incumbent on government to also 
behave differently and how it partners to find the ideas that create more imagination, right? And so one best practice I would say is, you know, artists who are engaged in community, and, I, and we have a lot of it around New York City. Um, this is my point about the laundromat project and some, you know, some of the amazing kind of guerrilla art projects that are, you know, public art, uh, or, you know, Ren was giving examples of, you know, these interactive art projects that are just very human and engage people. Like that's a best practice because um, it is connected. It invites residents in so that they're not just passive viewers of art, they're actually engaged in the process. Uh, but, that, but that when the art is calling attention to what we can do about it, right? Uh, you know, uh, this is why I'm going back to the point of with, with David's, uh, the, the postcards that are about the, the fossil fuel pipelines into city government actually points to a solution. <laughs> Right? It does. It, it is a concrete, okay, what is our idea about how we counter the money and politics coming from the fossil fuel industry? And that art can be the tool that engages us in a broader audience in that conversation. That's both the recognition, uh, but then how do we change that? And when I've seen art be really effective in activism, it's, that's, that's the, it's the intersection point between realization and then engagement and strategy. And, and, and so I, I would say that is an incredibly important best practice for artists to think about where and whom they're connected with so that their art is part of the activist discussion. And, at the, and I will, I'll give a plug for the new school because you know at Parsons, at Parsons, one of the reasons I went to the new school instead of going to a law school to teach despite the fact that I'm a lawyer is because we had urban policy we had social research and we had art and culture um, all in one university. And there is the Vera List Center. Uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to sit on the selection committee was literally giving awards uh, that includes money and recognition to artists who are engaged in social change. And so the, you know, the more that we're finding ways for artists to be engaged uh, with residents, the more we're going to see the impact uh, on how it helps government be more imaginative, because then there are more people pulling attention to it. Thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, certainly we'll go back to David, but we'll stay with you as long but as. Don't go back to David without buying his book because it's a phenomenal book. And I just want to say before I leave one, what a pleasure it is to be here. Ren is an old and personal and dear friend and a brilliant writer and, a, and one of the few people who sits at the intersection of politics, art and culture and communication. So thank you, Ren. And David, treasure. This is such an important book and your work is so important and impactful and it happens to be beautiful even as it gives me nightmares. So thank you for that. And thank you all of you for being on this call and buy the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank and you. I would add to that, buy the, book, buy the book from an independent bookstore. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> independent bookstores are the spine of democracy and they are really struggling right now. So do that. Uh, are there questions for David? Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you. <laughs> Anya, do we have questions for David? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, let me just pull that up. Um, yeah, we have a question from uh, Michael Benson. Um, I don't know if they're still here, but I can read it out. Um, yeah, I don't know if they're still in the chat room. Um, but the question was, Michael would love to hear more from David about the extent to which uh, Schenectady, AKA Electric City with its dystopian crumbling industrial infrastructure contributed to this epic work. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's where I grew up. It was part of just the, the air I was breathing. I mean, I remember in the 1980s, I mean, every year there'd be a, another announcement of another 20,000 or 30,000 layoffs. Uh, downtown at the GE power plant and stuff like that. And then at the same time, uh, all these new suburbs were being created. I would ride my bike and I'd see a new subdivision being bulldozed into existence. And uh, yeah, it was just part of the air I was breathing. It was, it was just, 
I, I wasn't even really conscious of what it meant until many, many years later. So uh, I don't know. I was just marinating in that whole, <laughs> whole uh, sort of, yeah, uh, just the failures of industrial capitalism and how it creates a mess that people don't want to deal with. So they just move somewhere else and make new neighborhoods far enough away that they don't have to think about it. That reminds me of a great line. I was just thinking of some of all the, uh, in, in your piece, all the, the disputations going on with the biplanes and so forth in the arc. And one of the great lines about Elon Musk's idea of moving to Mars, you know, that's, <laughs> we'll trash this planet and move to Mars. And there's a great poster that just said, he's not taking you with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Capitalism is not taking you with him in the, those kinds of futurist solutions. Right. Anya? Um, yeah, we have another question from Andre. Okay. Um, you're unmuted, yeah. Oh, uh, David, I was uh, going to uh, suggest you make this uh, an ongoing work that can go from industrial ruin to industrial ruin along the whole of the East Coast, even to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> On Elon Musk, I mean, can, can you do this as an ongoing work? Because it does seem that it has the potential of, uh, of doing that. That's a great idea. I mean, there's certainly plenty of raw material. I mean, <laughs> talk about that. Where do you get that? All those postcards? Oh, the postcards? Mm -hmm. I, I get them all from eBay. You just sort of uh, troll around and get them for 20 cents a piece. And then it just becomes really inexpensive raw material with no, uh, sort of no risk. You just sort of get, go ahead and use it. But I mean, to Andre's point, I mean, you know, upstate New York, where I grew up, it's like this whole chain of like uh, along the former Erie Canal, all those towns are just sort of mm -hmm. struggling to reinvent themselves by creating a brewery in an old factory and stuff like that. And I, would, I mean, just sort of back to Maya's point, I'm mean, gonna go a little bit outside this, but I mean, Maya's point about artist housing, I was a pretty hardcore law law activist for quite a while, ended up losing in court ourselves, so we all got kicked out, but uh, that whole, uh, reuse of industrial infrastructure and old factories and things like that as part of my New York City experience as well. So. Why do you think that, uh, David, that many of the places like Schenectady tend to, to vote Republican? And, uh, and uh, Because they're trying to recreate something that's lost. And they think if they sort of go back to the old ways of thinking about things and doing things, it'll magically erase all the things that they don't like. The fact that the factory shut down and all these sort of tree huggers say that you can't do anything there because it's polluted. Well, if we don't have those rules, maybe we can open the factory again. I can, I can get my job back. I think that's part of it. It ignores the fact that Republicans and other, you know, sort of uh, laissez-faire uh, capitalists don't believe in unions, for example, and don't believe in a living wage. They just want to sort of move jobs wherever it's cheapest. So I don't know. You, you and I have talked about how great it would be to, we, we, the piece has shown in a few places, as we say, in, in North Dakota and Michigan, uh, uh, and there were other places that were on the horizon when COVID struck and everything kind of slowed down, but what, would be, what do you think it would be like to show it in Schenectady, just in an abandoned storefront? Um, that would be great. I mean, I'd love to show it somewhere in like some uh, sort of abandoned storefront in Nebraska or, Idaho or anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons I did this piece is that, that sort of a lot of the individual postcards that you saw in the slideshow were kind of me shouting at the federal government and talking about DC and sort of like larger federal uh, policies and stuff like that. And one of the reasons I did this particular piece with all these backyards and sort of local parks and highways and little small towns is I, it's not about yelling at the senators to get them to do something so much as it is like convincing everybody else that they have to think about this in their own lives and they have to realize that it's not just a problem for New York City and California, even though that's the most obvious and most dramatic kind of stuff. But you know, in Iowa, they had that crazy inland hurricane that no one knew how to describe as a weather event and like droughts and all kinds of other things happening uh, 
you know, in, in the, the flyover states. So. I'm wondering, David, if uh, I know you, you said you wanted to maybe uh, navigate on your website and I'm going sure. like to do that now so we can get a closer look of some of the work. Yeah. Sure. Let me see if I can get this to work. Yeah. Let's go to Texas. Yeah. On, the, on the image, the where are all the all the planes are flying around and get a little closer. Oh. Yep. Cities. So yeah, legislative action will be premature. I think I don't know if that's a McConnellism, but it sure sounds like him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this whole cityscape is all about the conflicting uh, versions of how we need to think about this. Build the seawall. It's not our fault. Defund the arc as if this arc that's being made is some government boondoggle. Uh, fight the EPA. Antarctica, good move. That's like Elon Musk going to Mars. Uh, yeah, buy now oceanfront lots because as the sea levels rise, there's opportunity for real estate development. Uh, repent now, the end is nigh. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. So yeah, lots of different ways to think about this stuff. And uh, yeah, I don't know. No, it's not too late, up just above there, it's not too late the, where all the locusts are. Buy a ticket, buy a buy ticket it. on the ark, it's not too late. Go up and take a look at the ark again, that was kind of great. Sure, and yeah, we're gonna go past the uh, swarm of locusts, which is, both sort of an apocalyptic biblical reference in a sense, and also, you know, climate change and drought is what turns ordinary sort of peace-loving grasshopper like critters into swarming voracious uh, scavengers like locusts. So here, I'm sorry, here's the ark. It's a little blurry. There we go. Great. Yeah. It's funny. All over the piece, there are references to the ark. There's the ark. Yes. Seventy-six miles. There, you know. Uh, that people are really angry about the art. There's blimps that are advertising the art that crash. Oh, by the way, let's stop there at some place, some place safe. Here's this one, yeah. Here's that arc that's being, arc, arc blimp that's being uh, sort of taken out by the twin tornadoes. <laughs> right. Some place safe. safe. <laughs> so you painted in all those cars? Yes. <laughs> Going too far, you can tell. <laughs> It's funny, you once talked to me about how there was a stage in your kids' lives where if anything was missing, the tricycle or the uh, basketball hoop or something, it was doubtless in your studio. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Needed real life uh, models for a lot of the stuff I was doing. Just gonna wander around a little bit here. Frogs falling out here, here again, or some people trying to leave the city and the army has been called in to sort of keep them, keep them where they're supposed to be maybe. I don't know, it's just like a, a thousand little narratives in this whole thing. A lot of the graffiti is sort of uh, climate activists bemoaning the sort of the effects of uh, the oil industry or, or whatnot on what's happening. Volcanoes in the distance. So there's a little bit of like, sort of like slightly joking kind of like, uh, I don't know what, disaster. By the way, pull back a little bit on the crows. It's really interesting. So on the one hand, you have the, the corn, the desiccated corn that they're yeah. eating. And then a chest nights move over, you have the barricade that is basically the same on the road. That's the same, it's like a, a, a corn cob of rock. Oh yeah. <laughs> And that kind of thing happens. Well, this is the sort of thing that that when land for sale cheap over there, the 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 harvester is for sale because it's, it's too drought. There's so much drought now. I'm telling you, if you go there, and I just again urge you to, if you can, go visit Mana, call them, make an appointment, and you're often there by yourself. There's just, it's just so much detail, and and one of the things that's to me quite remarkable also is how beautifully. The pieces are stitched together, how bridges that are curving will connect a whole body of work, all these little details that for yeah, right, right. notice that one. These are the ones near the floor that no one notices because you have to get down on your knees. <laughs> and look at a, look at the floor, by the way. 
uh, some of you have all these cards and, and these are cards you bought and you left them out and you can read what people were writing to each other. Uh, yeah. Basically, you suddenly realize that it used to be that postcards were like like tweets or like, uh, or just yeah. like, it was just, you know, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are making sure that- Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow indicated that the, the postcard got there the next day. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so there's that whole thing. Yeah. There, oh, so let's take us over to the uh, albatrosses. Yeah. I, I love the albatrosses. Albatrosses. Uh, These I mean, guys? The pelicans, I'm sorry. Pelicans, yes. <laughs> and you painted in the, the six pack container. Uh, no. <laughs> yes, of course. And by the way, just below that, look at that Storm King. Yeah, yeah. And so that's your fantasy of what the world will look like. There won't be Build, a building on high ground. Yeah. yeah, building on high ground. So Here it is again, the Donner Pass. <laughs> and by the way, when you uh, when you arrive, you kind of assume that the sun thing is is sunrise over the horizon. But when you leave, you kind of realize it might be sunset. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what exactly. Double reading there. Yeah, I mean, I can just keep driving around unless anybody has any questions they want to sort of like talk about in particular. Look at look at the New York sign there. Yep. And then I'll you know lots of people with. Uh, a lot of people fleeing yeah. drought maybe somewhere or trying to, I don't know. The lifeboat, <laughs> people being tossed. I was thinking it's, it's striking because so many of these images feel so familiar and then you have like this slightly dystopic twist to them. But also like, you know, if I, if I step back, I could say like that is the Hudson and that is kind of what it looks like right now. It's, it's eerie. Um, yeah, yeah. I, think I mean, mo most of those people that were fleeing at this, at this time, there was a lot of people fleeing Libya and they were being sort of held in, in the Isle of Lesbos in, in Italy. And there was economic, there were economic migrants, but also fleeing droughts and like, you know, crop failures and things like that. It was a mixture of economic and sort of uh, ecological sort of uh, catastrophes that they were uh, running away from, which causes uh, conflict and wars and, and, and questions of personal safety. So mm -hmm. we're lucky enough that we just sort of have a sense that water is gonna come in and wreck our cities. It's not so much that we're gonna worry about droughts and famine. Mm -hmm. Here's a bunch of, here, here, here's a little Easter egg, by the way. There's a whole history of oil company mergers and acquisitions and <laughs> breakups incised in this oh. vine. It climbs up that, uh, burned out trees and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Can look at that again. Responsibility is not yet proven. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. <laughs> um, JC from The Rail has a question if you'd like to sure. um, take some questions now. Yeah, JC, if you want to unmute. Thanks. Yeah, I really care a lot for me today. Um, so, okay, there's this, there's this kind of element, there's this like strain of manifest destiny that like, or that like destiny as it as sort of is, um, would be realized at land's end. Um, and so there's this kind of like fatalism, I think, to westward expansion and, and um, a sort of like, yeah, death cult mentality in West in California. I mean, Baudrillard talks about it a little bit with like jogging as like an involvement ritual. And obviously there's all the actual cults in California. Um, I grew up like five miles away from Heaven's Gate house. Um, but so I guess there's this like, I guess were you thinking about that at all? Because I guess in, in some ways it feels like Americans seem to sort of expect these things to happen to them. The dual twister, like the hurricanes, like I think in, in popular imagination, it's like, that's what's coming to us um doomsday prepping is like obviously like a whole thing there's this uh and and i feel like that kind of fatalism is maybe like a like the primary force that like the, the primary kind of like imaginary imaginary that works against um like a lot of di didactic art um in in viewership so i don't know if you're thinking about that at all or if you have thoughts about that uh I don't know. I think I, I, I see the um, 
say something about manifest destiny and stuff like that. I mean, I, I kind of have a different angle. I feel that people always feel, always feel like there's somewhere else they can go to escape problems. There's always more land to sort of move to. There's like this, this infinite expanse of opportunity and resources to sort of be exploited. Or you can always move to another town, you can sell your house. I mean, at least in theory. And I don't know, I don't think, I don't know. Okay. I think, I think uh, part of that frontier sort of manifest destiny thing means that people will just sort of feel like they should just tough it out and, and hang on to their property and not leave when there's a tornado coming because they're going to defend their home as if they can personally stand between a hurricane and broken windows and stuff like that. So I don't know. That's not exactly what you were getting at, but it's kind of the kinds of things that I, I was thinking about at least. Personal property is something that is, uh, is the most important thing of all. And sort of like your stake and on, on your piece and your uh, plot of the, uh, the amber waves of grain and purple mountains of majesty is like this is mine and i'm, I'm gonna you know i'm gonna do with what do with it what i want to and uh i don't care if they say there's flooding coming in this is this is my this is my spot we're not going anywhere which is another uh kind of uh pun that's going on in your title of the piece this land it's not only the whole land but everybody acting as oh their little piece of land is is, is sacrosanct yeah, I mean, and one of the reasons I truncated the this land is yours land kind of thing idea is like, this is it. This is what we've got. We don't get another earth. <laughs> we don't get another do-over. It's like, you know, this is this is it. Anya, uh, we're probably coming to the end sort of, but are there any, maybe one or two more questions? And then I had one thing I wanted to read before we, we close. Yeah, we have a question um, from our publisher, Fong. Hey, David. Hi, Fong. How are you doing? I'm good. Hi, Ren. Thanks Hi. for wonderful conversation. I um, I remember actually following what JC just mentioned about Manifest Destiny. Actually, your show in 2008, David, at Ronald Feldman was entitled Manifest Destination. I think it was October issue that I interviewed you for the rail. And um, so my question is this, um, when Fred Tomaselli came here, um, you know, a few weeks ago, he talked about his work, which make me tied up a little bit with Rick Moody, also a friend of his. So I think of three of you guys being very interestingly um, sort of nailed into the different view of the suburb. You know, I think of Rick, um, as a dystopian view of a kind of psychological condition of family life that went wrong, especially in his book, The Ice, uh, Ice Storm. And Fred is always about a certain kind of celestial and hallucinatory aspiration as a form of spiritual escapism. And but whereas yours is really a, a social political failure in every, where everything went insanely crazy. Um, so I just wondering, the question is that, is that a fair reading of the three of you in somehow having gone, grown up in the suburb in some way? I know that Rick was not born in the suburb, but he's obsessed with the suburb. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, that, that seems fairly, fairly on point. I like that. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, growing up in the suburbs was a very, very big deal because uh, the proximity to the sort of crumbling downtown and how, uh, again, it was kind of like there's always somewhere else to move. You just like give up on the failures of the past and just sort of move somewhere else because there's always more land to be bulldozed and turned into housing or economic opportunity or another mall. And yeah, and also malls just sort of rotting. <laughs> before yeah. my eyes and like suddenly the mall we used to go to was just dead and we had to go 20 more miles somewhere else so yeah the suburbs are a very uniquely uniquely american creation and we've exported it i think to just about everywhere else and a lot of the rest of the world are making the same mistakes that we made because it temporarily works very well but in the end it just it's a dead end just like a lot of capitalism 
That reminds me, by the way, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in Van Nuys, California, in the San Fernando Valley. And the first shopping mall as such mm -hmm. occurred was the Northridge Mall. And, and the idea, and amazingly, I've written a lot about the German emigres in LA when Brecht and Schoenberg and Stravinsky and everybody else was in LA yeah. and Neutra, uh, that, that the, the guy who created the first mall, the Northridge Shopping Mall, uh, named Victor Gruen, his idea was a place where you could put all the cars around it, but you could have walking on the inside, a pedestrian area on the inside, because he was trying to recreate the Austrian village marts of his youth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of went the wrong way, but but uh, and now it's been now it's empty. But uh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the other thing that I remember from our interview then was that you grew up uh, being an NPR junkie, David. Uh, I mean, that the obsession of NPR was for you uh, what essentially created your early formation that led to the, the deepen, deepening interest in politics and everything else. Can you sort of share with us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, I wouldn't call it obs Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> ha having, having moved from uh, upstate New York to Cincinnati, Ohio, and then ending up in New York City, uh, one connection I had to what was, uh, I mean, my introduction to a large city with overlapping concerns, uh, a, a subway system, uh, a city budget that actually mattered in terms of how it affected me. And like, you know, like, uh, like I was talking about with the loft law, I was already very aware of my uh, situation in a, in a gray zone with the, the Department of Buildings and the fire department in the city and the land, my landlord and the real estate market. WNYC, um, the, the local radio station was a really great resource and a way for me to understand uh, where I was living in 1995. And it's sort of coincidentally, a lot of stuff just started crashing into everyone's world. I mean, like suddenly we all knew where Afghanistan was and you know, global terrorism and all those other kinds of things, which you know had its primary target in New York City. And uh, the mayor's races and considerations of politics and economics and uh, yeah, the military and stuff like that. I think it was just sort of an a, a really great sort of filter funnel uh, to sort of absorb all that kind of stuff through the radio, which is the way that works, especially for artists, because you're using your hands and you're using your eyes to make things and then your ears are sort of available to sort of take stuff in instead of reading the newspaper, which is valuable, but you can't do that while you're working on a, a work of art. And watching TV while you're making art doesn't work either, especially for me. But the radio is a great way to sort of have a stream of information and ideas and sort of concerns. And for me in particular, it sort of fed directly into what I was thinking about as I was making things. Yeah. I mean, and subject matter as well. Yeah. I think that maybe Ren can, can uh, follow this too, because you also observe in David's work for a long time. I always have a feeling that after September 11, your work got even more deepened with a certain kind of political amplification, especially the body of work at Brooklyn Hall. Must have been in, you know, 2004 or five, I can't remember exactly the date, but it really it seemed to be, you know, pushing towards a certain aspiration, pictorially speaking. Yeah. I mean, that, the whole uh, foreign policy and things like that became the biggest piece of news that anybody thought about. And it was also just sort of another way of uh, shifting, I guess I was shifting from doing a more oblique criti criticism of suburban sensibilities to then moving a little bit more directly political and, and then uh, the, the subject matter that was there and kind of in everybody's forefront of everybody's mind was sort of Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, terrorism, uh, the Bush administration, um, and things like that. I think in the end, I ended up, after doing a lot of that, I, I started to realize that maybe I was 
yelling too much at the, at the federal government. And maybe it was time to start, start thinking about stuff that wasn't quite so headline driven maybe. Mm -hmm. And is maybe about something that's more long term and existential, like climate change and things like that. Yeah. The thing about climate change in that regard, Hong, is is that it is the, it really is the place. And this is five hundred individual pictures of yeah. how it is, the epic made local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where, you know, all this stuff isn't happening in Afghanistan and it's not, I mean, it's, ha it's part of it, but, but it's happening in the town square. It's happening over by the dam. It's happening, you know, yeah. uh, in the meadows. And, and, and I, I, anyway, maybe this is a, a good place to begin to uh, pull things together that we've been going for a while, but, but I, I did want to uh, uh, end my contribution anyway, first of all, by thanking David both for his contribution today for the for the incredible piece again urging people to go see it uh, and let's all think about ways to get it on the road so it, so it, after COVID is over it starts showing up in in Little Rock and then uh, you know in, in Georgia for example it'd be great to have it in Georgia right now yeah but uh, but anyway uh, so thank you I wanted to thank Maya also thank you Fong and Anya for your your help and everybody who's been watching. I wanted to end uh, the way the book ends. We began with Jonathan Shell, and then we have the last see, the part of the book is the, the falling frog. And I, almost as important as Jonathan Shell in my formation was Ellen Willis, the great uh, feminist writer, but also just a social activist across the board. And we end the book by this, uh, going back to the question of denial and, and despair and ritual despair. And I had this quote from her book, Beginning to See the Light. And maybe we'll end the, the, the event with this, this from Ellen Willis. The modernists wants subversive refusal to be gulled or lulled has long since degenerated into a ritual despair, at least as corrupt, soft-minded and cowardly, not to say smug, as the false cheer it replaced. The terms of the dialectic have reversed. Now the subversive task is to affirm an authentic postmodernist optimism that gives full weight to the existent horror and possible or probable apocalyptic disaster, and yet insists credibly that we can well overcome. The catch is that you have to be an optimist, an American question mark, in the first place, not to dismiss such a project as insane. And yet, that's what we have before us. It, the, the book ends on thinking one last thought about this land. And maybe we'll go out looking at the, the piece. And again, thank you everybody for being with us. Thank you so much, Ren. Thank you, David. Um, and before we close, um, at the rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch uh, with a poem. Um, and we've carried uh, that tradition into these community uh, Zoom events. So today I'm thrilled to welcome um, Allison Adele Hedgecoke to the stage. Uh, Allison Adele Hedgecoke is the author of a memoir, a play, and seven poetry books, including the forthcoming, book, uh, forthcoming Look at This Blue. A distinguished professor at UC Riverside, uh, she teaches creative writing um, at School of Medicine and directs UCR Writers Week and UCR along the Chaparro. So I'm gonna... Um, Pass the mic to you, Allison. Thank you. This is a really uh, engaging and beautiful talk and love the work that was just shown. Definitely getting a book. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from a new, it's a hundred page poem uh, that's coming out with Coffee House Press. It's called, Look at This Blue. And I'll read the very first uh, excerpt in it. Um, it begins with an epigraph. The path we have taken has rotted. Ignite, stand upright, conduct yourself like lightning. Tanya Tagak from Retribution. Look at this blue. Circe's blue butterfly from the sand dunes of San Francisco. First known American butterfly to become extinct due to humans 
first known. Redwood burrows cut like blisters, shaved from trunks, poach life source from root, killing giants in knobby growth removals. Baseline, canopy height, bud issue, unsprouted genetic code for clone, apparent tree emergence, barrel at my mouth, ready cocked, held there by my baby brother's bare grip. Lemon wedge, half moon pops over, flat cossum, shallows, over sweet sound, low rustle and low dive water, chortle trill, night language from standing. Cranes, sand hills, they've been there, all along standing still, knee deep in station pools. Arise, Orion hovering eastward, drawn and readied. Someone slinks past door jam, each chokehold felled vaporizes cognizance. In a world fast shaking herself loose, from diabolical torrent, rising throttle song above throttle breath, choked out between calligraphies, madness clenched, fury unfurled release, misery met in each pummeled break, it's not over. Sleep in despair, sleeping moth-tongued, unrolled against central incisors, human-throated, deep yearns for saxophone trachea, windpipe, Sandhills chortle, only saving grace, wetlands marshaled, nothing here on Guardian Watch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, what a beautiful reading. And thank you, David and Ren, um, and to all who tuned in today for this event and all who asked questions. Um, this October marked the Rails 20th anniversary and we're going to be celebrating all the way into 2021. Um, please consider making a year-end contribution to keep the Rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent, um, like the NSC Lunchtime series and our We the Immigrants project. Every amount matters to us and our goal is to double last year's participation and reach 500 donors. Um, and I'll put information in the chat for more information um, where you could ask one of our team members. And please join us next Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Isabel Sandoval, Rosa Daniel Lang Levitsky, and Mackenzie Wark. And we'll continue with, uh, we'll conclude, conclude that with a poetry reading from Drew Pham. And now you should be able to turn um, off your microphone and say goodbye. Thank you all. Nice. Thank you, David. Uh, thank, thanks, you. David. Thank, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks, Lauren. Oh. Hey, like, thanks, bye. Allison. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. That was terrific.